Well, here we are in a windy, windy, windy Monday morning, and uh, Pat McArthur always on the coast, uh, almost, and uh, exposed to the westerly breezes. Seems to be in good shape. How was your night, Pat? Was it very blowy? Oh, it was unbelievable. Uh, quite a few people are saying that's the worst storm. There's a woman here who would be slightly older than me, and she said the last storm she remembers like this was uh, Debbie in 1961. No, it, yeah. it, was quite, it was quite a storm here. No one done it all. They seem to come with such regularity now. Uh, they actually are. Like my son said, he had um, a shed out the back was blown over. He says he's definitely lost a couple of tiles off his roof. Uh, mm. Trees were down all over the place. Judah, I think as far as I know, there's something like about 200,000 people across the country with, uh, or without power as we speak. Even the local radio station this morning uh was off air for a while. Yeah, I think they had to switch to a generator, uh, and so on. And last night there was you no, know, as usual, due on social media, there was uh, electricity wires down, and I think it was just outside Remelton, you know, outside Letterkenny. Yeah, uh, we town out there. there. There was actually sparks in the road as they, you know, the live wires were, oh were hitting God. something. Yeah, yeah. You know, so yeah. Jude, you know, and if you drive into that in a car, you, you're electrocuted. So yeah. it's not funny, and uh, there's still a massive job. The funny thing is, dude, they're, they're, uh, here on, then on um, RT, they're saying there's a lull today, but it could start up again tomorrow. I've never oh. heard of that before. Oh, spare us, spare us. Uh, well, you suddenly realise how dependent you are on electricity. I mean, we've always yeah. had electricity all our lives, most of us. And uh, yeah. once it's cut off, we're helpless. You know, storing food yeah. in the fridge. Uh, moving around, absolutely. TV. Uh, and see in West Donegal on along the coast yesterday, there were people off there from about I think about two or three o'clock yesterday. Now, though, I heard I was sitting doing my column for that other thing that I do, and I started doing it about twelve o'clock. And the one I I'm sitting near a window, and I could hear the wind starting to you know get a growl outside. Yeah. So Jude, it's, it's you know it's quite and no, it's just even brought it in, but there's no doubt about it, Jude. This whole thing about climate change is as as a real oh, issue. Yeah. Big time, big time. And uh, we've heard her just the level of cavemen and cave women huddling around a fire. Uh, and yeah. you know, everything else is gone. No TV, yeah. I guess, no Wi Fi. Um, yeah. And uh, no heat, no light, no bloody anything. Um, so it is tough. It is tough, Pat. It yeah. is well, we're made of stern stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's another forecast. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, let's, yeah. let's get back again tomorrow. You might, you might as well admit that it is something worthwhile talking about today because uh, last night was quite a humdinger. Uh, funny yeah. thing is, our sister lives in Sligo and they never mentioned yeah. Sligo. And yet, I mean, she lives very near the water there. And I would have thought that the coming into Sligo, Ross's Point would have been very bashed around. But uh, they never mentioned it. Yeah, the, uh, uh, Sligo Airport, re re I think, uh, record, no, I'm seriously open to question this. Uh, Sligo Airport re recorded one of the strongest gusts. I think it was somewhere about 160 kilometers an hour, which is about 100 miles an hour. No, it yeah. was a gust, but still, I think Sligo recorded one of the highest. You know, like up, up if you go up around Malm Head, Jude, and around by sort of Kaldath and around you know, all that sort of stuff, that's real, real exposed territory. Mm -hmm. you even go up there on an, an average day, and you'll find a quite a strong one. But, you know, the houses up there must be made of stern stuff because, as you see, when the storm comes in off the sea, it's not like, you know, you're the shelter of inland. You're totally, totally exposed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not just the houses are made of stern stuff, the people too. So are the people. Yeah, <laughs> they really are. Okay, let's move on and talk about things political. On Friday, we, you and I were holding our breath and saying, going to be a breakthrough. Everybody was saying, expect a breakthrough. Someone, commentator, I don't know who it was, um, said, I'll believe it when I see it. Um, yeah. And I've, I've been down this road before where hopes are really high and then Monday comes and you realise the work shouldn't have been raised at all. Um, yeah. Were you expecting the breakthrough, Pat? Uh, I don't know what I was expecting, but uh, the, the, the whole... Exp uh, sorry, I'll rephrase it. See, on, on Friday morning, I remember listening to Andy McLafferty and he says that they are now, he, he, was, he had some source and he remember he, he said the, this guy told him it was yay or nay day. Yeah, you know, uh, and so on. Now I think, and I genuinely believe this, I believe this that they chickened out of it totally because they they knew they hadn't got uh, Sir Jeffrey knew he hadn't got the numbers, and so on. Jude, here I have a very subtle thing at this stage. I I think anybody, 
uh, that's got half a brain at this stage must be saying, right, we've had two years of this. You know, we just can't keep on doing this. Like, I've had 150,000 people stood out on the snow and the rain and the cold last Thursday and protest. This, uh, what, uh, you, you, and what, since 2019, the health service numbers or those requiring health service have traveled. The uh, people and working for the nurses, doctors, firemen are all about two years behind in pay that uh, their counterparts on, on the mainland. Uh, everything's just fallen apart, dude. And Heaton Harris can't keep on saying, I am not going to make a decision. He should say, right, there's direct rule and here's what's happening. Or he should say the DUP. He should set a date for the DUP that on the, say this, the 15th of February, either you say you're going back in or you say you're not, and then I will act accordingly. Do you yeah. see this drift? Oh, I can't delivering. It's a disaster. And I think it's time everybody's fed up with it. And seeing t uh, over £2 billion pounds dangling in the air, <clears throat> which really should be allocated, is absurd, absolutely absurd. Yeah. Um, I, I, well, everybody I've um, heard talking say there's going to be a really serious split one way or another. Whenever they go back, yeah. they'll have to go back eventually, or they'll have to come to a decision. But there's going to be a serious split in the DUP between the hardliners and the guys like Jeffrey, who are, you know, people. Some people who see them as puppets, but they probably re represent the majority, just about. In the DUP, at least I'd think so. Would you? Would you agree with that reckoning? Yeah, just about, Jude. Uh, yeah. But you, you know what? I, and we've all been down this road before. But I do find amazing that a guy who got one hundred and sixty-seven votes uh, <laughs> uh, and another guy who got elected as a single. Uh, he's tried many times. Jim Allister. He's the sole TUV representative. Uh, by yeah. the way, he gets a party political broadcast on BBC. Um, um, never ceases to amaze me. A man with a party of one. But I, I just, I, two people. You know, uh, you know, when you add in as uh, um, the DUP, the UUP, uh, SDLP, Sinn Fein, Alliance, two two small people can hold this country. You know, they influence so much. You know, you, you sort of go. Well, this is insane. Like, we've got 167 votes, another guy who's got a party of one, and yet they seem to be dragging the DUP by the nose and holding back the rest of us by some considerable distance. Well, really strange. Um, uh, it's hard to believe that that can go on. And besides that, in the background, all the time, you have the demographics growing and growing and growing, or shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, whichever way you want to look at it. The shrinking of the unionist population uh, the growth comparatively, at least, of the nationalist population. So um, he's sitting in a seat I wouldn't like to be sitting in at the moment. Now, I don't know if there's any way out. Um, maybe he'll come up with something. Hard to tell, hard to tell, hard to tell. And it's amazing what you, you, know, you can swallow when you have to. It's, it's, it's the job of leaders to lead. Yeah. And you know, yeah. somewhere along the line, Trump, how do you make a decision? Martin McGuinness, how do you make a decision? John yeah. Hume, how do you make a decision? They all how do you make decisions about what, you know, and there was, you know, Bertie Ahern, even in Articles 2 and 3, and people like that, I don't know if it was Bertie actually made them decision. I think it was. But anyway, oh, so, no, those were all tough decisions. Hmm. But here, here's the thing. Sir Jeffrey is going to have to make up his wee, um, mind. Uh, and look, uh, as, as unionism going down the right road by staying out, or is it going do, down the wrong road? And like, I think anyone, and I'm genuinely meaning this with a brain, can see that unionism is actually doing the job. And I've said this a million times, too, and I really am bored saying it myself, but I think uh, they're doing a fantastic job oh, yeah. for the Republican movement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More power to the wheel in that case. OK, let's move on from uh, the sad case of a party called DUP and come to another sad case, which is a, a stadium called Parky Keeve. Um, <laughs> they're being faced in Cork with the possibility of changing their name to some commercial, I don't know what it is, a Super Mac or something like that. Oh, Super Value, Super, super Value, yeah. Uh, how, how, what do you think? I mean, a lot of stadiums like Aviva Stadium and any number of uh, stadiums in the in Britain are named after commercial companies, uh, Emirates Stadium yeah. and so on. Um, would you feel uneasy if there was a change in Parky Heap or even Croke Park? I mean, sometimes I, I start. Sometimes I wonder about the. Um, the GA, there's a lot, a lot of hypocrisy going on in the GA. Now, by the way, I think uh, Park O'Keefe was the name after Emmanuel O'Keefe, who ah. was the general secretary of like, the GA from about 1930 
about 1964. He was the longest serving and and the, the place in Cork is named after him and yeah. so on. But hey, Jude, let's get something clear. The GEA has, you know, uh, made lots of money over the years. You, if you look at, uh, just what, if you watch uh, your Tyrone play in Donegal, just look at the jerseys. The, you know, uh, a Team Kingspan or whatever the hell it is. Or yeah. Bref, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, you know, I think Donegal, it's Highland Hotel, something or other. I can't even remember now. What uh, it is. Uh, uh. Every team has got a sponsorship. You know, and they, they, they say there's no money in the GA. Some years back, and I'll not mention it because I think the man's dead now, but there was a certain person offered a job as manager. I think it was Mayo or Ross Common, somewhere down there. And by the way, these are supposed to be amateurs, amateurs, not paid. Yeah, and, you know, yeah, and yeah. Th this man had no job, but suddenly he had a car and a very nice lifestyle. <laughs> so somebody along the way was paying him. And should, is anyone seriously telling me that a guy who's now a manager of Donegal, Tyrone, Cork, Galway, Dublin, you take any county, and it, it's almost a full time position that he's not getting paid. Yet officially, he's not getting paid. Oh, of course. And you know, of course, of course, the only paid. people not getting paid in the GA yeah. are the players. Yeah. But you, know, you look at uh, uh, their sponsorship. Every by the way, Mister O'Keefe himself was a, apparently, by all accounts, a hell of a good businessman. Yeah. But during his years in charge of the GA, he did all sorts of deals mm. with Guinness and sponsorship mm. deals, and he uh, and he built all sorts of stadiums and so, all the rest. Uh, so the, there's a wee bit of hypocrisy in the GA. So are you, saying, are you saying, Pat, that because there is so much commercialism in the game, in the GA, that uh, they might as well name stadiums after um, Super Value or whatever? Well, what's the difference? As I said, it's Super Value... Well, you see, I think they're... I'm, and, and by I'm, the way, I'm going to say, I, I, I've been on the easy feeling about that. You know, I don't know why it is, but uh, yeah. I just think it's sort of silly. Like Leicester, for example, the team, Leicester Football Club in England, they're named the Kings... Their stadium's called the Kingspan Stadium and you've Emirates Stadium and all over the place. I just... You see, names are funny things. Like, Pat, for example, if I was I said to you... Uh, Change your name. Change your name to um, Mr. Super Value. Uh, would you do it? If you were, I suppose you're getting a million quid, would you do it? You wouldn't. And you're a commercial man. I mean, now. I mean, my, 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 my identity would be gone down the, the tube. Well, if, if that's the case, case, the same thing should apply to the stadiums. I mean, Jude, that's, an, I will, Jude, that's an inanimate object. It's a stadium, it's not a human uh, being. Ah, uh, but we're still talking about the part of names. Everything's named. Human yeah. beings are named, and stadiums are named, and countryside's named, and counties and countries and but so you know, on. Ray, hold on. Can I back you up for a minute? Park and Keith suddenly becomes becomes super value Park and Keith, and Cork GA, as far as I know, I think they're sixteen million quid in debt. Yeah. So they suddenly get I don't know how much they get from super value, maybe two or three million. That yeah. eases the financial burden. It keeps uh, the stadium up and running for them for yeah. another couple of years, and it solves uh, a few problems. You know, and uh, all the other ones as well. And Jude, let's be honest, the GEA is a very, very commercial organisation. They sold, uh, uh, what do you call it, broadcasting rights to Sky some years back. Yeah. You know, and that meant, you know, uh, you know that uh, people, even people like me and you, who might want, you might want to watch Tyrone, who are a rotten team, and I want to watch the brilliant Donegal <laughs> team. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, but you can't see it because it's on Sky unless you... Uh, uh, oh, well, I find that irritating. I do find that irritating. Yeah. But uh, I, I, no, I find it very interesting, this thing about names. Um, I, I'm trying to think of who the comedian was. He was very good. He said about the fact that he couldn't afford to, um, he couldn't afford to have a personalised number plate. So he was going to change his name to, you know, AE18PKK. If you notice, that would be his name. And it matched with his number plate. Um, yeah. I think there's something kind of deep, you know. Uh, if you think for a minute, Pat, Think of some of the importance of, of uh, names in politics here, like Londonderry or Northern yeah. Ireland or six counties or the province, mm. you know, there's a, or the mainland. There's a whole lot of yeah. things that we would, you and I would really balk at being forced to use yeah. regularly or even, you know, even semi-regularly. Uh, Yet, yeah. when it comes to Parky Key, we're saying, oh, well, they might as well stick on Super Value on as well, get rid of their debts. I'd be against it. And, and in fact, I'd be against a lot of the um, a lot of the commercialization that's going on. For example, yeah. I think the thing about managers is really daft. They'd really yeah. need to come clean. Uh, now, admittedly, it's bringing up the quality of football. 
but I'm not sure that they're not making a fool of yourself by saying, oh, no, we don't pay our managers. And then you hear, oh, yeah. uh, uh, you know, uh, what's his name is going to go to uh, uh, be the manager for Jerry. And I wonder if that's a good idea. And he's going to yeah. going to go to him. And he, gonna, he was um, he was the manager for Louth. You know, obviously they're being paid. Obviously there's finance involved. So yeah. I, I just wish that we have shouldn't have this level of hypocrisy. Um, yeah. uh, and, and as I say, I still have a sneaking feeling that I I sort of support those who don't want Parky Keeve to be changed. I, in yeah. a way, it's like it's like the commercial world putting its foot on your neck and saying yes. Yeah. Now you're leaving. You're leaving. That's what they did with slaves. Incidentally, remember Cassius Clay? He said, "That's my slave name. Yeah. I'm Muhammad Ali." And that's true. Every single yeah. one of the slave, oh, every black in the, in the states, is named after probably um, uh, the master of whatever. No, slave they're they're white owners. Yeah. yeah, yeah, So yeah. it's the same thing. Isn't but, it? You know, another thing. Um, you see, you can only be uh, what would you say? Um, you can only be a wee bit pregnant, and you can only be a wee bit <laughs> pure. You know, uh, what do you call it? In the sense that once once the GA went down, you know, putting sponsorship on jerseys. Uh, getting all sorts of money to run things and all the rest. So you you go into that world. Like, what's the difference? Like, dude, uh, everywhere I look, you, you look around the GA ground, you see sponsorship boards on on the place. You do. You see you the do. jerseys, what yeah, you call it. Yeah, yeah. You see whatever. Uh, and uh, you know, I think the GA are, are as much. They're the most professional amateur organization I've ever <laughs> come across. They are think... the most commercial amateur yeah. organization I've ever come across. <laughs> do you think it's worth the price? Because, you see, if I think in terms of soccer, like you have these uh, teams like Newcastle and Man City owned by yeah. Middle Eastern countries, and I think it's sort of obscene in a way and daft, you might say countries owning English clubs, but you see the quality of play and you watch a Manchester United versus Newcastle game and you say, oh, God, this is so good. Uh, and yeah. likewise with the GAA, the level of football, I think the standard of football is so much better now than it was. I watched a bit of that Glenn versus St. Bridget's yesterday. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, I was final. watching a bit of it yesterday. And, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, they played so much like soccer teams, you know, recycling yeah. the ball, moving it around. Uh, yeah, and so they're now so a goalkeeper. Yeah. Uh, you know, no, uh, I think back to you know, J- Jimmy Keaveney had played for Dublin. I he remember was, him well. He was a, uh, but he was about three stone overweight. <laughs> he would right. never make it to the Dublin team now because he would he'd have to run all day. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of people said that at the time too, but he got the gold, did I tell you? Anyway, there was a well, it doesn't matter. I, I don't think he would make it now. <laughs> it's a different game. Uh, no, that's true. That's true. Uh, but maybe, maybe, maybe that's the price we have to pay. Uh, our lives are dominated. We, you know, we're seen as consumers I mean, rather I mean, than Dr. citizens. Doctor Collins, let me. I, I'm just drawing this to your attention. Uh, uh, maybe you've noticed. It's uh, my screen has got very dark. It's got very dark outside. All of a sudden again. Oh, is that right? Well, I can see one half of your face yes. and perfectly, but the yeah, other no, half... It's, it's, it's suddenly become very overcast. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Sorry, just, just draw well, that you, attention. I guess you get swept away in a storm, like uh, like yeah. over the rainbow. Yeah. Remember when what's over the rainbow. swept away by a storm? Uh, we're going to uh, Kansas. <laughs> so if you if you suddenly disappear out the window, we'll know what has happened. Okay. Um. Anyway, I, I, I would say Shakespeare might believe that, why, say, what's in a name, a rose by any other name, yeah. it's smell as sweet. But um, I I I think it's it's pretty important. Actually, uh, you know something. I I would agree. I know what you're you're harking back to the fact that the GA is an organisation that's got a grassroots. It's what probably a grassroots organisation. And there was mm. something really nice about the fact that it was almost pure. That mm. it was belonged to the people. And this increasing commercialization, morality starts going out the window, and principles start going out the window. I don't just, I get that totally, mm. but the reality seems to be that the GA want to be part of this world. That you know that they you, you know if you're going to sell your name for jerseys, going to have boards around the the grounds, you're going I, all, all this sort of stuff. Yeah, once you go down that road and selling rights to TVs, not you know, then you suddenly can't pull back from that. I suppose you're right. I suppose you're right. I have to accept it and just rejoice in the quality of the football and the and the hurling that we're seeing, which is really, really stimulating. Okay. Um. Next item on the on the program is um the there's an article by I'm not sure who it is. Uh, yes, Dermot Ferzer in today's Irish Times, and it's about O'Connell Street, and he's saying that the surge in police numbers is over. You remember the time of the riots? Yeah. 
They had a huge number yeah. of policemen. They got them in there after they got the riots quelled. And uh, oh, other people say, oh, it was great to see a policeman. Uh, but now they've gone back again. And further points out, there really is no difference in terms of the level of crime. That there is yeah. not a certain level of crime when the police were there. And now that the numbers have faded back again, there's still about the same number of crimes. So it's not really the crime centre that most people tend to think of it as. It might not be the nicest street, it might have a lot of drug taking and so on. But according to him, it's not something we should worry about too much. Um, yeah. he, I wonder if, if they'd had increased, he, I think he asked this question, if they had had increased police presence, would that have stopped the riots in the first place? Probably, did, but uh, I think what they're saying, uh, Helen McEntee, the Minister for Justice, and uh, yeah. Drew Harris, after you know, several events, including, remember, the raids in Dublin, and then the, <laughs> before that, a couple of months before that, an American tourist was oh, yes, seriously yes, beaten up. He, he, he had life-changing injuries. I think he was he's left blind in one eye, as far as I yeah. remember. But anyway, uh, yeah, the bottom line of it all is, I think they spent something like, they had a budget. The, the government provided 10 uh, million more for Gardy for, I think, around about August and September. And there were something like 240,000 man hours. And the minute the budget uh, ran out, so did the cops. They were bringing cops to it from uh, as far away from Gal um, Sligo up, up to Dublin uh, uh, to, to sort of per, um, pound the streets to make, you know, to visibility. It's all for yeah. optics. But apparently not a single, well, maybe somebody else could uh, correct me here, but I think the crime rates, the statistics didn't change, the number of incidents didn't change, but maybe uh, it meant, meant a lot of other people felt maybe more secure. And sometimes justice not only be, be done, but be seen to be done. Maybe having guarded presence on the streets that did deter other people from doing things. Aye. But the bottom Aye, line, well, I, think, I think what they're saying is, look, if, if it's just a sort of like a stopgap thing and just for optics, it's not the way to go. All right. I think it did, right? But uh, I would also take that point for you, a very good one. Uh, the fact, whether or not it stops crime, it creates a different mood when you see a, a guard on the street. You know, you just feel yeah. that bit more easy. You somehow feel yeah. you're, uh, more, uh, you're safer. Uh, so it's not, not a bad idea, maybe. Uh, but um, the, the, the problems are deeper. The problems, first of all, is in terms of the drug taking and the rules and the laws about drug taking. The problem is poverty and why so many people are stunk, sunk in po uh, poverty in one of the richest yeah. states in the world. Uh, yeah. So those are the things that need to be addressed rather than should we put a few more cops in. And in fact, if you're talking about cops, you need to look at how much they're being paid and what how yeah. far it is a democratic organisation where 98% of the people don't like the questioner and yet he stays in place. No problem. No yeah. questions. No politicians saying, geez, if you have 98% of the people that are in the organisation don't like them, we should at least be addressing that question. They don't do it. Yeah. I, I find that astonishing. Well, uh, I think the, the whole issue of pay and conditions, like, uh, apparently they're having real problems recruiting staff or yeah. the people to join it. Secondly, the, the sort of uh, the people leaving are, are are an increasing numbers. In fact, I think this this I, I could be wrong, but I think there's more leaving this year than they're actually recruiting. Oh, you geez. know, by resignations yeah, yeah. and retirements and so yeah, on. Yeah. So, Jude, it's, and, and it's uh, and like Jude, our guardy are uh, unarmed, and the the. the they are uh, there. Are, there are quite a lot of um, restrictions. Jude, it, my wife was reading yesterday. A Garda and a wee rural place. Or uh, last uh, couple of years back, there was no during COVID. There's a guy. Uh, he had his bike stolen or something, and there was a there was a bike in the Garda station. I'd been there for a couple of years apparently, and so on. And the guard gave the old man the bike out of the goodness of his heart. He thought, "Well, it's not there, so I'll give it him." Yeah, he was suspended and charged <laughs> with some sort of theft. And he was only he was he, he was off duty for two years. He was arrested in front of his wife and children for doing this. Dude, I know a lot of cops in the Republic are sort of saying, and I noticed. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll, re I'll go back. Yeah, I remember during the riots, there was a guard and he was being surrounded by a quite aggressive crowd, and he had a button and he had a couple, of, and he didn't pull out. He just kept pushing it back. Yeah, you know, these people were sort of 
And apparently there are, a lot of them are scared shitless for doing something in case they end up in a disciplinary ah, procedure. That's just ridiculous. I know, I know, you know, you don't you don't want police brutality. We've had enough of that in the north. No, but we've had at enough the same of that. Time, exactly. A policeman should feel safe in doing the job he's doing. I, I'm amazed. Do they carry pepper spray or that kind of thing? Yeah, well, I think after after the the red thing, uh, there was going they were going to apparently they were going to get body cams, pepper spray, and some sort of uh, uh, retrenchable buttons. You know that they sort of can, you know, uh, that they're uh, easy to get. Yeah, yeah, some sort of stuff that they could for, for personal protection, and then they could also prove. Like we were getting attacked rather than us attacking them. Type yeah, thing. that'd be a good idea. It'd also be a good idea to pay them a bit, bit more than they're paying them because people don't leave yeah, exactly. their job. Yeah. If their job's yeah. well paid, they'll not leave it. But if these guys are leaving, you can be sure they're being underpaid. Uh, and they do, yeah. they do valuable work, very important work. And, uh, you know, they they, they are, they, I would see them as being the link, from, in many cases, the link between the world of authority and the people. And if that's not yeah. working properly, uh, there's some bad stuff going to happen. John Hume used to claim every society needed a police force. Mm. I remember him being asked, you know, do you support the RUC? He said, answer all that. I support any police force that acts fair and impartially. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think that's you a very know, reasonable uh, sort of take on it. Um, but yeah. anyway, it's daft that they're sort of uh, pretending it's all fixed now and they're ignoring mm. essentially the underlying problems, which are poverty and drug taking in Connell Street at least. Yeah. And then when you come to the policemen, uh, the guards themselves, they, their wishes, their view of things and how it could be improved. I mean, 98% of the guardy don't want something that's going to be bad for the guardy. You know, yeah. <laughs> ridiculous yeah. to ignore it. You know, anyway, anyway, leave it aside. Okay, final item, Pat. So I better make a good one now. This is by a woman called Catherine Day. Do you, have you, does it mean anything to you? Doesn't I don't I don't. I've well, heard the name. Her. Yeah, I've heard the name. Uh, maybe she's a columnist regularly with them, but uh, she has a bit on this. Really, no, dude, she's uh, she's involved in um, uh, some sort of homeless thing, dude. Uh, oh. Think I'm sorry. Uh, some sort. No, it's an NGO type thing. She's not a journalist. Uh, uh Well, she she writes she writes an interesting column today, and it's about a topic I feel. Uh, really needs scrutiny, and that's to do with uh, immigrants. And she provides one or two facts and figures. Now, remember the last day I was saying what we should have are clear statements about how many um, immigration uh, immigrants do we have in the state of uh, the so southern state and the north, for that matter. Uh, uh, where are they? Where how are they spaced out over the country? On what grounds is it right to have every county the same amount, or do you do it by the number of people in the population in each county. So a whole lot of things like that to make it uh, clear and fair and allow people to be involved in decision making. Anyway, that's what I was saying. She says, she starts off by a fairly striking point. She says, anybody says Ireland is full is wrong. Ireland is not full, she says, neither socially nor spatially. So there's room. Now we have a big, the yeah. South has a very, really big uh, population. It's the highest in 170 years which is astonishing when you think about it. That's pre-famine. Um, so, uh, but she also points out there's 12% of those are not Irish, which suggests there's 12% mm -hmm. of the people are in fact immigrants. Um, she says one third of nurses and midwives are uh, immigrants. They're not Irish or yes. uh, that's their background. Uh, and she says last year, would you guess at how many thousand were applications were made? Wow. 13,000. 13,000. And that wasn't seen as anything too extraordinary. Now, she makes no. uh, she makes a couple of points I think are pretty good. One is that they, they need what you need to do is get uh, provision for these people. Uh, uh, before you integrate them, they should be housed in somewhere that is decent and reasonable. And apparently the, the government, uh, I saw Michal Martin on TV yesterday, saying they're going to have something like six uh, big sort of uh, government spaces, as it were, where immigrants yeah. can stay while their, their application is being processed. I think that's very important. Yeah. So that once that's done and if they're accepted, then they can be integrated into the community, get a job and be a yeah. part of things. Uh, I think most Irish people would go along with that if they thought it was being played fair. Of course, there's a rump of idiots who think you know they're so bloody superior that if any any immigrant came in, obviously be diluting the racial purity of Ireland. Um, 
Yeah. But most Irish people are very fair. But if they lay out the facts for them, how many is coming in? How does that compare? For example, she says where the South is among the lower uh, number of applicants compared to other countries in the EU. I didn't know that. Did you? No, I didn't. No, I was just listening to most of that there. It's, it's unbelievable. Dude, one day I was driving around Donegal, me and my wife used to call it, or call it gallivanting days. We just go for a drive. <laughs> yeah. And I remember one day we drove up around that Glentish Hour Drive, Glen Collin. Dude, yeah. there, are, there are tracts of land as far as the eye can see and not a <laughs> single house to be seen. Yeah. We are not full physically under any set, set of circumstances. But here's the other thing as well, Jude. One of the problems that this government has done and all previous government. They tried to solve this problem by depending on the private sector, mm. uh, almost coercing people in wee villages to take five, four, three or four hundred people and all that sort of stuff. It was a disaster, is a disaster. And Jude, uh, by the way, a lot of the, the thugs are showing up at the same different places, you mm. know, uh, mm. yet, but they're then you cannot allow them to dictate the agenda. No way. No there way. are real, uh, uh, there, yeah. there are yeah. real concerns. Yeah. Their, their mothers and fathers with young children who are saying, wait a minute, we can't get a doctor's appointment. We can't get our kids into school. We can't get, and yet you're throwing these people. And dude, that's genuine real problems in a lot of villages. Like a lot of places now, uh, the, there's no uh, GP practice anymore. And mm. so on. And there's all sorts of social problems. Like down in a place like Melville, uh Now, by the way, there's about 10 places that have uh, uh, places burned out by these uh, people, it almost seems like it's coordinated, but I don't know, the guard even need to answer that. Mm. But anyway, bottom line, line of all, same of all, Jude, if you took on about 40 or 50 people, on a winter's day, Jude, there's no library in Moville, there's no swimming pool in Moville, uh, I don't, uh, there might be a GA, which I'm not sure, but there are no, there's no hospital in Moville, there's no, doc the, I think the doctor's surgery is well oversubscribed. So what does, say, 40 um, uh, families uh, do in, down in Moville on a winter's day? And seriously, where's Jude? See what you said earlier on. If they build, uh, say, three, four, five massive uh, reception centres for asylum seekers where they could house them and uh, proper facilities, doctors, accommodation, uh, you know, uh, you know, recreation facilities, whatever, it's paid for by the state. This, this, this is what they're doing now. It's costing the state an absolute arm and a leg. As I told you last week, somebody was telling me that there are people in Donegal, imagine Donegal earning 100000 a week oh, housing yeah, that's, that's asylum true. seekers. Imagine if we true. built a purpose-built yeah. centre somewhere, you know, yeah. and, and, and a greenfield site, where and there's then there's not there's, there, you're not closing a local hotel you're not closing local facilities yeah. and you're providing facilities that are proper and uh, and yeah. adequate for people who uh, and that I emphasize that are temporary I I think actually uh, uh, Catherine D says in her article that the state the South is at present not is in breach of its legal obligations to provide shelter yeah. for people for applicants uh, and I think that's fair enough. They need to give them, as you say, decent accommodation and services for that six months and then get them plugged in quickly into the system because there isn't a hell of a lot of unemployment in the South as far as yeah. I know. And that's how, I mean, you talk about doctors and um, so on. That's how the state runs. You know, you have people working, they pay taxes, and that's what makes for payment of doctors. Do you, do you, you know, or... I've mentioned this before, but 20 years ago when a lot of Polish people came here, there was the, the usual crap. But then suddenly this people discovered these guys are, uh, well, uh, you know, my son, when he wants uh, the electric trucks in his, in his car, and he goes to a Polish guy, he's the best guy going. There's a couple of, there's a building not too far from me called, well, it was known as e &I Engineering. As far as I'm aware, there are a lot of the Polish guys, they have done apprenticeships in electronics and engineering, and they can't get enough of them. Uh, so, dude, the Ukrainians are very, very smart people. They're, you know, well-educated and all the rest of I am of the opinion that if if it was properly organised, we could benefit greatly from those course, people. Yeah. Dude, the, the other point about it is, uh, see some of the loony tunes running around here. The Ukrainians didn't leave Ukraine for a bit of crack. They left because they were getting bombed. Yeah. You know, you know. Yeah. The, yeah. I wish they would drop the racist crap. There might be a, maybe the government should be held to account for this in part, at least, Pat. I, I, I said this last day, I'm going to say it again. From the very beginning, and I think Catherine Day says this in her article, from the beginning, the community where you're thinking of sending something should be involved in the planning, the acceptance, etc. From day one, because if somebody landed me and said next weekend there's going to be about you know 200 immigrants, 
you know, yeah, yeah, that, even you are pro-immigration, you have to do a mm-hmm. gear change in your head when you're suddenly told Absolutely. this is going to happen and you're, you don't have any say in it. Are these guys crypto-fascists or what? That they're, you know, they just don't think they need to consult people? That's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, in, in ways, you could accuse, this is a, a harsh statement, in ways you could accuse some of our politicians of being racist, that they yeah. don't involve yeah, yeah, or anti-democratic. Uh, just, I, just, they, they said that, uh, one of the, uh, I heard one of the thinking guys on some time back said, one of the reasons they didn't consult was, uh, was local communities before, and was that just simply gives the community a chance to sort of, Build up opposition. I, I, well, that's proven proven to be a disaster. We are doing it. Whereas, if you went along and said to people, "Right, here's we're bringing in thirty families into um, Mobile Kilometer and uh, Oma somewhere, it doesn't matter, and just say we're bringing them in, and here he, and we have a discussion. What's the problems? What what do you see? And you set up and, and you have some sort of discussions, and people say, "Well, will you provide extra uh, doctors, extra GPs? Will you provide sort of facilities and so on?" And if you make uh, sit down and have a rational discussion with rational people, that cuts out the you know all the sort of uh, you know propaganda and the racism. And I've, I've ordinary people who live in the community say, "Oh no, we're satisfied that everything is going to be okay. That they can there will be extra school provision and yeah. et cetera, et cetera." And yeah. dude, I'd say most reasonable people say that's fine. Yeah, I I I think I have one layer before that, and that would be you'd show the people. How how many immigrants are coming into the country or the state? Uh, wh- where, why it makes sense to distribute them this way? Why there's, is it fair to have them in the, these kind of numbers? And how you're doing your part, same as everybody else, when we say you should take this number. I think people have to be reassured on that. There's this feeling that, you know, some some people are getting away with it. And it's not in their backyard, but we're soft. Yeah. And they're going yeah. to slam them into us in our backyard. Anyway, yeah. that's enough of that. Pat. Tell me something nice. Can you set a poem for me? Or I, I, I'll leave you with this. Hey, Jude. Mm. Uh, it's a cheering thought. Ron, Ron, Ron DeSantis pulled out of uh, oh, uh, the race last night. So we've got, it's, all, it's now n- nearly 95% certain that Donald Trump will be the candidate to run on the US presidential <laughs> election. Ron the Sanctimonious gave him a, a lift Monday morning, leg up. Monday morning. What? What? Ron the Sanctimonious gave him a leg up. Oh, he... He's, he was one, you know, he was asked there quite recently, even though he was aware that it was about 15,000, 20,000 Palestinians dead. He said, I, I support Israel 100% and they should keep doing what they're doing. And I thought, what a lovely, warm human being. Uh, you are know, you talking about Trump or are you talking about DeSantis? No, it's DeSantis. Oh. So DeSantis, you know, you know, this, uh, it, abs- it was just purely for the Jewish vote. Oh, he didn't yeah. give a monkey's about Well, he's no loss I, I, I thought that was despicable. Uh, no loss. Although I see where he's endorsed Trump, despite the fact that Trump yeah. called him Ron the Sanctimonious. He still says, Trump's yeah. a great man, and I'm with all my support. Yeah. Right behind him. Oh, yeah. God, they deserve each other. Uh, this is going to be a really interesting year, Pat. We should draw up a list sometime of, of uh, different elections and then call them. How about that? Yeah, about see, six see how much we get wrong. we'll tell them what's going to happen. Prophesy. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Okay. Right,